I've got a series of questions from Alistair Ayton, who says he's got questions for all three speakers, if I get the chance. Uh, he answered the comment that uh, all three papers were great, thanks. Now, the first question is for David. Uh, Alistair says that he was struck by the criticisms of the Black Prince in the sources you outlined. How exploitative was the Black Prince's lordship? Was it exploitation on an unprecedented scale? Are not the criticisms made in such sources, especially the financial complaints outlined, outlined in the Anonymale Chronicle, the sorts of complaints we would expect to see, that we would expect to see of medieval princes and lords? I think that's very interesting. Um, I think to some extent, yes. I think there, there are interesting comparisons to draw between the Black Prince's administration, for example, what Matt was talking about earlier in the Principality of Wales and how that impacts on the marcher lords. And clearly there he is seeking to explore the full extent of his authority. Um, and he does, I think, something very similar in Aquitaine. It is, I think it's clear that what's happening there is he is implementing what he sees as a relatively normal, probably quite firm administration, if that's the appropriate way to put it. Um, but not something which is necessarily, it, it strikes me as, as desperately exploitative, if one views this from an English perspective. I think what's unusual in Aquitaine is the fact that there has been very little of this sort of direct lordship implemented and that the, the Gascons and particularly the nobility from the greater Aquitaine simply haven't been subjected to this sort of thing. I think there is also a particular sort of context to this. There strikes me as a significant difference between the former lands of the Duchy of Gascony and the Greater Aquitaine, which is created through the Treaty of Brittany. And there you're looking at a series of nobles who have been actively opposed to the Black Prince and who in 1355-56 were subjected to some of the most appalling socio-economic warfare. It is hardly surprising that many of them are not necessarily well disposed towards him in the first place. He's interesting, the Black Prince, and it's difficult to see if what's being done in all of these areas is down to him or whether it's down to members of his council. You can see, for example, the way that he deals with circumstances, for example, after the Black Death, that there are fairly significant differences between the administration in Cornwall and, say, the administration in Cheshire. In Cornwall, he seems to be really very understanding. Rents are remitted. Um, th there's a renegotiation, basically, of financial impositions. And in many ways, Cornwall um, gets out of it pretty well. In Cheshire and in Wales, it's much more heavy handed. So it, it, it's difficult to, to come up, I think, with a, a sort of balanced picture of the prince's administration. I don't think, though, that there is any question that he personally is very aware of his status and seeks to demonstrate that in a variety of ways. OK, thanks, David. Um, I think Alistair must still be typing the other two questions that he refers to, because um, I, I haven't yet uh, received them. But in, in the meantime, uh, there's a question for you, you Laura. Uh, this is from Claire Etty. Uh, what was Alice's legal status at the time of her trial in terms of her position as a married woman? That is a very interesting uh, and pertinent question um, because essentially we don't know for certain when she actually marries Windsor. Um, Walsingham says it's during the Good Parliament and the King finds out in the Good Parliament but that that then there's no reference um, to that being her referring to herself as Windsor's husband, um, as Windsor is her husband after then. But what does happen is that after her trial in say November, December, 1377, um, Windsor and Alice jointly try to get her conviction 
overturned on the basis that she was a married woman and um, she, she had been tried as a single woman and she um, was in fact married at that time. I think it's most likely, um, and it's something I'm looking at at the moment, so still to sort of firmly decide, but what, but what I previously argued, and I think what I, I, I still would argue, is actually the most likely time when the marriage occurred um, was in the summer of 1377, so after Edward III's death, but before her um, trial, why then she wouldn't have made that more explicit unless it was a long-term plan to yeah, keep, keep the marriage hidden so then she could use that legal argument or they could jointly use that legal argument in the aftermath. Maybe they got married slightly later, um, but certainly um, it's, it's around that time. And I think most likely, that um, it was after Edward III's death. Um, it might have been 1376, but there was no reason for, Mar for Alice to jeopardize um, her status and situation as, as Edward's mistress by, by marrying at that time, I don't think. Um, but yes, it's very, very interesting. And particularly the way, so she's tried as a single woman and then say they, they try to use the argument that she was in fact married and therefore the, the the, her conviction and forfeiture wasn't valid. Okay, thanks, Laura. Um, I think Alistair's second question has come in, but I'll just uh, t take the next one on my list, uh, which is another one for yourself, Laura, and this is again from Patrick McDonough. Um, is there any evidence for the relationship between Edmund Mortimer and Alice Perez before mm -hmm. the Good Parliament, or between Philippa of Clarence and Alice? No, I haven't got anything um, uh, actually sort of indicating, uh, yeah, personal grievances or, or an, I guess, thinking back to your previous question uh, in regards to land, there's not sort of a, a particular a tussle over um, uh, uh, an individual piece of land or piece of conflict. So no, I don't. But what's very interesting is um, I do have a, an example of that with uh, Henry Percy who's future first Earl of Northumberland. And that's around the fact that um, Alice receives the wardship of uh, Henry's half sister, Mary Percy. So there you do get a, a really nice narrative and example of how she's coming into individual um, conflict. But no, interestingly, you don't get that uh, with Mortimer. So with, um, with, with those two, it's more of a sense of that, that general anger and frustration um, uh, with the court party and Alice being part of that. Thanks. Um, so, right, I'll move on to Alice's uh, next question. Uh, he starts um, by saying thanks to David for your uh, detailed and appreciated answer. Uh, but then a question for Matt. Uh, again, Alice has a very thought-provoking paper. Thanks very much. And his question is, how well received or not were new appointments like, Mont like William Montague, who, as you said, went from being a banneret to a leading marcher figure as Lord of Denby in one fell swoop uh, by the existing marcher figures. So yes, so how well received were those new appointments uh, by the existing Lords of the March? And was there much ill feeling between pre-existing families towards the likes of Montague? Um, yeah, good, good question, Alistair, thanks. Um, I suppose the short answer is no, I don't think there was much ill feeling. I think the, the I mean, Chris Given Wilson, for example, has written um, convincingly on this and, and compared Edward II's uh, promotions into the titled nobility with Edward III's in people like William Montague. And I think it is it is really important that what Edward III tends to be very good at doing until we get to the, the period Laura was talking about is uh, promoting and um, giving uh, lands and so on to people who have proven themselves and their abilities uh, to king and also to realm. Uh, and Montague is a good example of that. I mean, he is the key driving force behind the coup of 1330 at Nottingham Castle. But he also has a very good military uh, record and uh, 
in other areas of, of political life. Um, they, the people who rock it up in Edward III's reign also tend to um, be married uh, into existing sort of old noble families, uh, which helps uh, ease them into uh, the upper echelons of the nobility through uh, marriage and, and family ties. Um, there is there has been some suggestions that that Montague and uh, some of the new nobles uh, were unpopular on the basis of protests made in a crisis in 1341. Uh, in which uh, Bishop Stratford, um, the Archbishop of Canterbury, fell out with Edward III. I, I think uh, those protests probably apply to some of the members of the King's household at that point, rather than to the likes of Montague, who moved out of the household for some time by then. Um, but it is, yeah, it, it, it's key to the whole reign that, that these people are. Uh, cycled up through the ranks without generating the kind of friction that, for example, Hugh Dispenser, Piers Gaveston, uh, generated under under Edward II. Um, and, and that seems to be a case of choosing the right people as much as anything. Uh, and, you know, Edward II doesn't do that. Edward III generally does. Uh, Richard II, as we know, generally doesn't either. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Matt. Um... I've got a couple more questions. Uh, one, one which is, is pertinent from uh, Sue Benyon Tinker. Um, could I ask Laura, is there a biography of Alice Perez, please? And many thanks for a fascinating afternoon of talks. I, I think, Aunt Laura, the answer is that you are about to publish one. Uh, well, I'm not sure about to use the word, but certainly I'm a, I'm a good way through the, the, the writing of it. So, yes, hopefully sooner in the next 12 months or right. so. <laughs> well, that would be good to, to, to look out for. Uh, who, who will be publishing it? Um, I haven't actually got a, a publisher yet, but I, I will let you know when I do. Right. Well, no, it, well indeed. Announcements due on Twitter. Yes. Well, let, let, do, let, it, do let us know, Laura, because um, you know, we, you know, we, we can... Um, it would like to do a little article about it in our quarterly uh, newsletter, uh, as well as uh, commissioning a review um, in, 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 our, in the journal. That'd be lovely. Um, now, uh, Kate Andrews, uh, does Desmond, I was like, you can tell I, you're going to tell I only got a grade C uh, in my French O level. <laughs> uh, does Desmond, what Desmond, Gone completely. Uh, Dave Muswell suggests married status. No, there's uh, quite a lot of discussion um, about this, and um, um, oh, her name will come back to me. Um, uh, historian um, based in America. She's been looking at all all the um, all of Philippa's ladies across the the, the whole of um, her realm. Caroline Dunn, is it? Um, and basically, it. In the 19th century, people put a lot of store on trying to convert these terms um, sort of straight from uh, the medieval French into what you know could be then um, applied to ladies in waiting, um, which ha did have um, and do have very strict rules around marital status. However, that you can't apply those um, consistently. In, in the Middle Ages. So no, in terms of, it's it's more to do with uh, status. You, you have the dames, the damoiselles, um, uh, sous damsel, damoiselles, and then the villaresses, and those are sort of the four ranks. Um, but what we do know is that Alice was um, married and more accurately widowed um, before she became Edward III's mistress. So she had a first husband uh, called Janin Perez. Um, so it is her married name who died um, probably in about 1361. Um, so at the point when she becomes Edward's mistress, when she joins the queen's household, um, she is actually um, married and, or, or indeed already widowed at that stage. Thanks. Uh, and now a question from Andy King to, for all the panelists to, to comment on. Um, is it just that Edward was very good at managing his favourites in the early part in the earlier part of his reign? 
who wants to start? Shall I? Shall I start? Um, I, I think that, that's certainly certainly part of it, Andy. But um, I think also um, he's very good at working within the general uh, and changing sort of structures of of kingship from a, a more sort of structural point of view as well. Um, we heard from from David about Piers Gaveston and the Earldom of Cornwall, uh, and for example. What Edward III doesn't do is give that earldom in particular to one of his friends, because that earldom is held to be uh, very closely related to the royal family. Um, so I think what Edward does is 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 uh, he's very good at working within accepted parameters of reward, um, but he doesn't tend to um, publicly sort of abuse those parameters. So I. I think he's, he's, he not only makes the right friends, but he deals with them in the right way. And his whole sort of kingship uh, has this driving force about meeting his obligations, uh, I think, that um, helps him uh, reconcile his personal, in the first part of the reign at least, reconcile his personal friendships and connections and desires with the um, understanding of the wider community about what he should be doing. Okay, uh, uh, Laura or David, do, do you want to add anything to that? Oh, I was going to say, I, I think Matt, Matt's um, put it perfectly and I, I would entirely agree. I think there's also something to be said about how well um, uh, Edward managed his family, which obviously David has uh, talked a lot about in terms of, yeah, the sort of the... Um, uh, the responsibilities and the lands, but there's also a lot to be said in terms of um, how, yeah, creating, we talk about the House of Magnificence. Um, Mark Ormrod has uh, written at length about um, how he created this sort of dynastic vision. Um, on one of my slides, I had um, one of the images of Philippa, that's from a, um, a complete sort of wall um, panel that was in St Stephen's Chapel, which is essentially at Westminster, essentially celebrating that this dynasty and the unity from that. And um, one of Mark's arguments, uh, which I would entirely agree with, is that actually with Philip of Hainaut becoming um, uh, more ill herself in the 1360s and then dying in in 1360, um, that also has a really dramatic uh, impact. And I think that loss. Of dynastic unity within the family, then that sort of naturally also spreads out to the wider um, upper nobility. Okay, thanks. Um, no, a question now from Connor Wilson. Um, sorry, from Connor Williams. Um, a question for Matt. Uh, was was Montague the only one of Edward the Third's? Ed, sorry, was. Was Montague the only one of Edward III's quote unquote new men, as James Bothwell would say, was he the only one promoted in the march? Or did other new men see advancement, uh, i.e. Guy de Brion, who I believe held Walwyn Castle in Pembrokeshire? Um, well, Connor, Connor sounds like he knows more. For, in terms of the men who were made um, the new, the new men who were made earls. Um, the march generally didn't feature hugely for those other than Montague. I mean, w William Bone is the one who is active in the march, but he is the brother of the Earl of Hereford and Essex. Um, so is is isn't really necessarily a, 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 a you know a young upstart. Um, but he purchases land certainly in the middle of March in, in sort of collaboration with the Earl of Hereford, his brother, and they work quite closely together in terms of land management and um, extracting resources from that. Um, interestingly, Edward, talking of Montgomery, um, in the memoranda roles, there is an indication that an inquiry was made about Montgomery Castle on behalf of Robert Ufford, who's another of uh, Edward's friends in this period. Uh, but it, there's no annotation saying that, that, uh, that a grant was then made um, subsequent to that inquiry. And what I suspect is that um, 
because Ufford was generally based in Suffolk, Montgomery was very far out of his way and it wouldn't have been essentially a natural gift to give him in any case. Um, so that sort of shows that um, the patterns of lordship and the march weren't amenable necessarily to sort of people from completely outside, the complete newcomers coming in the first place. Um, and that is why I suspect that the march doesn't feature particularly heavily for some of the other earls Edward III creates. Uh, but in terms of in various knights and, and people of lesser status, I, I haven't uh, done a great deal of research on them, so I, I can't um, answer. And, 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 and of course, you, you can pursue the conversation with Connor <laughs> next time you see him in the corridors. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, and Alistair's final question has come in. Um, this, so one for Laura. Uh, thanks for a great paper. Did Alice Perez provide a convenient or even inconvenient means of criticizing Edward III's kingly rule without criticizing the king himself? Also, the quote you gave, it is not fitting or safe for all the keys of the kingdom to hang from the belt of one woman is an extraordinary statement. Alice is clearly an influential and intriguing figure, but isn't this clearly exaggerated? Oh, and, and he adds, good luck with the book. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, uh, yes, and the criticism of both Alice and indeed all those who come under criticism in, in, the, in the good parliament very much. Um, th this is how um, the, the wider political community generally um, calls the, the king and the royal household to account, so, and, and the king personally, with that, you know, before taking more extreme measures, it's always about um, helping the king, essentially, and, and that is always the, the rhetoric that it is used on these occasions, that, um, that they are doing this for the, for the king's benefit. Um, so it is, it's that, that way, it is essentially criticising uh, the poor uh, kingship of the king, but without saying that, and instead it's sort of flipped on its head, and they say we're doing all this. Um, it's not the king's fault. This is, um, you know, it's all his evil counsellors, um, etc. Um, and by removing him, this is for for, for his benefit. Um, obviously, then you you get the more extreme step when they do criticise kings, but really that's when you're getting close to the point of very dramatic um, action uh, up until that stage and certainly with a king like Edward III who has been much beloved and um, respected. Um, uh, yes, it's, it's always sort of couched in that language, but really it, it is a criticism of the king himself. And actually very interestingly, Walsingham, um, he does criticise Edward d directly um, in the Chronicles. So although in Parliament they don't go as far, far as that, um, in the Chronicles that they are happy to and willing to and um, there's sort of excuses for his relationship with Alice but there is criticism of him directly for it um, uh, as well um, and then sorry what was the second uh, part of the question? Uh, what well, is, is um, Alice is clearly an influential and intriguing figure oh the the but, the it, but is it, is it but it, is her is it is that is that exaggerated I uh, because yeah. of because it was safer to blame her than blame the king. Um, yes, in terms of safer to blame her than blame the king. Although again, Brinton is more explicit in, in his criticism. He sits in Parliament, so he knows what's going on. But he's he's definitely as soon as you get away from the official record, they do get much closer to criticising Edward um, himself, and and that includes Brinton in his sermon. I think what's so interesting about that is that it's clearly. Uh, an exaggeration that she is yeah, making all the decisions um, and it's all down to her. I think what's really interesting about that is that that is the perception and this is a genuine perception that, um, and you get it in Walsingham as well, he talks about her and her um, her cronies essentially. They, they, they both those sources, they, they put her in a, in a leading role and I, and, I, and I think that sort of comes down to the fact that Although Latimer and Neville um, and other members of the, the council 
um, are more powerful in their ability to make decisions, there is this strong sense that if they weren't getting on with Alice, they wouldn't last very long. And actually keeping her on side was fundamental mm -hmm. to all of the power, you know, the, the court party as it was, wouldn't have been able to do what they did without her having, you know, that, that controlling power over Edward really through that intimate access. If, if we if we move forward 70, 80 years to the next period when there is a weak, infirm king and a powerful woman, do, does Margaret of Anjou receive similar criticism or, or does she not because she is a queen? No, no, she very much uh, is heavily criticised um, for her actions. And certainly there's this sense of any woman, regardless of whether they have the authority, as Margaret did, um, or Alice, who did not, if they're sort of undermining those ideas of how to be a good woman, and as an extension of that, as its most dramatic sense, how to be a good queen, um, if they're not fulfilling um, those ideals, and indeed being much too aggressive politically, which is part of that, um, then, then they will be criticised in, in very similar fashion. And indeed, the flip side of that, you get mistresses uh, like Elizabeth Shaw, who actually are praised, um, whereas the Queen Elizabeth Woodville is being criticised. And it's all about actions more than actual status, which is interesting. <laughs> Good. Uh, I have got I have got one more question, um, but uh, it's it is amazingly uh, already ten past five. So what <laughs> I'm going to do, if people are happy with this, I'll do a sort of some formal closing comments. Uh, but then if people are happy just to carry on for another five or 10 minutes, um, I'll, I'll put the final uh, question to you, because um, a, a huge number of people have uh, stayed with us, uh, which I think reflects uh, the, 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 how, how interesting the questions have been. Um, but So I'll just give the formal thanks to David, Matt and Laura. Uh, it's been a fascinating afternoon. Uh, from, a, from a personal view, I would say well nigh perfect, uh, as I've just noticed that Liverpool scored in the fourth minute of injury time uh, to go top of the table, uh, Chelsea having been defeated earlier. Um, so three, three great talks and Liverpool top of the table. Uh, what, what could make for a, a better afternoon? Uh, so <laughs> thanks very much. Um, whilst uh, sort of Laura's here, I'll just give a very long uh, uh, notice. Uh, many of you will be aware um, that the 1st of August 2023 um, is the 700th anniversary of Roger Mortimer's escape from the Tower of London. Uh, and we have booked conference facilities in the Tower uh, on the 1st of August 2023, the 700th anniversary, uh, for a, a conference. Uh, in, in recognition of, of Roger Mortimer's escape. And Laura will be joining us as, as one of the speakers uh, at that conference. Uh, so make a note of that in your diary. Um, as uh, Hugh said, um, people who are not members of the society, we hope that you uh, have, have enjoyed this afternoon uh, and indeed uh, would consider uh, jo joining the uh, society. Uh, it's very simple to do uh, online um, and uh, so sort we of can do, do it very quickly. Um, also, there will be a recording uh, of this uh, event uh, uh, made available uh, very shortly. Uh, the Zoom recording will be edited into the individual talks and made available through the Mortimer History, History Society website. Um, and so within a week or so, or perhaps possibly less, uh, you, you'll be able to access uh, each of the talks if you want to sort of re refresh what has been said. Um, as I said, there's one more question, um, but I'll just sort of um, you know, formally, if, when people could, if people want to switch back on their videos now, uh, you know, if that uh, throws a, a wobble into the system, uh, that doesn't matter. Um, but if we sort of, uh, whilst a number of people are still with us, if we give our thanks to the three speakers for an excellent afternoon.
and yes, we've had one we've had one person uh, who has um, joined us on the phone all afternoon, uh, which uh, you know remarkable uh, dedication. Um, okay, so you know, that's the sort of official end of the proceedings. But you know, if people want to ask any further questions, uh, then please do so. Um, the, the one question that I've got, which again, all three speakers might want to comment on um, from Andy King, um, is what characteristics of an empire do you think that the English dominions have collectively? Yeah. Yeah. David, would you like to comment yeah. on that? I, I think it's really interesting and um, whether it, it's very difficult to know whether this is quite the right word. I suppose in the same way that we tend to conceive rightly or wrongly as of the Angevin Empire as an empire, then in the same sort of way we yeah. can think of the Plantagenet <laughs> Empire in a similar sort of fashion. Um, I think there, there is clearly a sort of collective mentality to governing those estates. I think there is increasing evidence, and I'm sure there is really interesting work that could be done to look at those people who Edward III, for example, but I think more broadly the Plantagenet monarchs move around into administrative positions, not necessarily at quite the elite level that I was thinking about today, but slightly below that. It seems fairly evident from some preliminary work that there are a number of people that work on the frontiers of these estates who get transferred between them. This is not necessarily in a, an overtly sort of structured and sophisticated way, but I think they are clearly doing it in that, that fashion. Um, I, I mean, I, I think you can look at both Edward I and Richard II as having some conception of a sort of high kingship or perhaps an imperial conception of their authority within the British Isles. Whether Edward III does it in quite the same way, I'm not sure, but I think the way that he certainly is thinking of um, constructing a Plantagenet realm that extends overseas and incorporates his children. If, if we don't call it an empire, I'm not quite sure what sort of term we can use. I, I absolutely accept that it carries with it a lot of baggage. Um, you end up calling it the sort of Plantagenet thing or something. I, I'm not quite sure what the, the appropriate term is for it. Um, but it, it's certainly something which it seems to me gab, carries with it a governing mindset, a sense of allegiance to the same monarch, how deeply felt that's, um, that is, is, is tricky to say. That there's a complaint that I'm reminded of that comes out in, I think, 1341 um, from Ireland, which talks very clearly about your liege people of Ireland and making a comparison with those in Gascony and Scotland and Wales, which suggests an awareness of, if nothing else, common allegiance. Uh, uh, to, to, add to, um, to add to what Deborah said, I think the so the project I'm working on now is is styled as a as um, power across the Plantagenet Empire, and and the, the way I've sort of come to think of it is, I, I think it, it's useful to separate whether people at the time actively conceived themselves as part of an English empire, which you know I, I don't think they did. They may be high kingship, uh, but for me the important thing is. I still think we as historians looking back can use empire as an analytical category to view English kingship and these various dominions, because I think what empire allows us to do is to move beyond the study of national borders and isolated, uh, isolating England from Gascony, from Wales, from Ireland, um, because empire allows us to capture it to capture the diversity of the Plantagenet, Plantagenet dominions uh, within one shared reference point and that reference point is English kingship uh, so that's why I think it's useful I think it's a useful way of trying to conceive of all these dominions as part of a shared world which I think they were and whether or not you know we want to sort of 
haggle over the, the, the term as such. I still think it's it's the best term out there, as David said. I mean, I'm not sure there's a better one. But I think it is important to try and to try and conceive of these places in relation to each other, definitely. Mm -hmm. And um, Laura, do you want to add anything? Uh, no, I, I, I mean, Matt, Matt and David are very much um, two of the people le leading the field on this. So very much um, can see to their um, uh, much more informed thoughts than I would have on it. Only to add that um, if anybody uh, is interested um, in these questions, um, there is a fascinating article by um, Michael Bennett on the imperial ambitions of Richard II in the Feshrift Thor, Chris Gibbon Wilson, which I had the pleasure to be one of the editors uh, for. So if anybody is interested in, in that, to, to uh, seek that, that chapter out, because that's uh, very interesting. Although, and again, then you, it gets into interesting conversations um, about sort of imperial ambition versus empire. And uh, yeah, that, that terminology and are we talking about same or different? slightly different things. Um, so yes, um, yeah. Yep, okay, thanks. Well, and Andy has added, um, perhaps empire, in inverted commas, is the worst term to use, except for all the others. It's very um, <laughs> just, <laughs> um, just sort of, one, one sort of thought, you know, sort of, you know, listening to, to the talks that you know, occurs to me and which you know, is a recurring thought for me. Um, you know, if you sort of think about the uh, role that uh, Roger Mortimer, 2nd Earl of March, was beginning to play in the 1350s, uh, restored to all his lands and titles, marrying his daughter, in, marrying his son into the royal family, but then dies young. Then his son Edmund grows up again begins to play a prominent role in national affairs as Laura uh, has described, but then dies young uh, in 1381. And then his own son again inherits as a young man, but then during the 1390s again begins to play a prominent role uh, in national affairs, but again only to die young in a skirmish in Ireland. And that just leaves you, I think we won the big what ifs of the 14th centuries. Uh, what, you know, what, what if one of those Mortimers had not died young, uh, but had survived um, and, and, and built upon the, uh, those experiences? Absolutely. I, mean, I think, I think um, particularly perhaps the, the fourth Earl dying in 1398, uh, if he had died perhaps in 1402, and been around when Henry Bolingbroke landed in England. You know, it's a, it's a fascinating question, and, and that that is probably you know one of the key um, accidents in the in the whole political history of the late and middle ages, isn't it? Is it's this this skirmish dying in Irish clothing uh, in Ireland? Is um, you know what I think you're, you're right, Philip. It's it's this series of misfortunes that sort of the sort of accidents that that shape shape history as well as the grand designs of people like Edward III. Yes, because yes, as, as you know, um, it, it, in many ways, it was Mortimer's death that opened the door for Bodingbrook, uh, because it, it was then when, uh, after Mortimer's death, when uh, Richard uh, went to Ireland, uh, partly, in part, to avenge Mortimer's death, of, but for other reasons as well, that that enabled Bodingbrook to return. And so the combination of, of, the combination of Richard II's absence and the abeyance of any possible Mortimer claim, uh, because with the fifth Earl still being a child, uh, it, that is, that's what opened the door to Bodingbrook. Uh, but yes, if, um, if Roger Mortimer, the fifth Earl, had not died in 1398, and if Richard had continued childless and unpopular, then th things could have been very different. Which, I, I should know this, but I don't. Which, which of the Mortimers is it who has the Welsh praise poem, which talks about how he is kin to four blameless nations. The, um, the, the Roger Mortimer the fifth Earl. Right. Yeah. Which uh, it, suggests this conception of transnational lordship, or perhaps some sort of sense of being a member of a, a Plantagenet empire. Yes. 
Um, yes, indeed. Um, oh, sorry, Paul, Paul, sorry, Paul's corrected me. Sorry, Paul's corrected me. Uh, Roger Mortimer the fourth third, of course. Thank you, Paul. Uh, yes, Roger Mortimer the fourth third of March. Um, yeah, it was during the late uh, 1390s, um, at the height of the unpopularity um, of uh, Richard II. Uh, and yes, the, and the Mortimers were, were burnishing uh, a claim and burnishing their lineage. Uh, and yeah, I mean, you're referring to the praise poem by um, uh, Yolo Goch. Um, and of course, what the Mortimers um, you know, well, uh, uh, periodically had done, um, but particularly in this period, I think, were emphasizing their lineage from the princes of Gwynedd mm. uh, through the marriage of um, Ralph Mortimer to Gladys Thebe, daughter of Clawarin ab uh, because of course uh, the descent uh, from King Alfred, sorry, the descent from King Arthur uh, went uh, through the princes of Wales. And so through their marriage into the line of the Prince of the Gwynedd, the Mortimers could claim descent from King Arthur, which of course the Norman, Anglo-Norman, Angevin kings of England uh, could not claim. Right, thanks for coming to my rescue, Paul. Right, I think things have come to a natural end. <laughs> Uh, and I'm, I'm starting to get uh, some uh, sort of calls from uh, outside that uh, my, my tea is going to be ready soon. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, important. Also, so I, 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 need to go, I need to go make sure now that Match of the Day is on record. Because <laughs> with, 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 with Chelsea losing and Liverpool winning, I need to, I need to watch the highlights tonight. <laughs> well, I'm so anyway. I'm enjoy, Philip, I'm sure you are. <laughs> Right, a number, pe people are now uh, sending a number of chat messages to thank us for a fascinating uh, afternoon and to thank the speakers. So I'll just e echo that and uh, my thanks again to Laura, to Matt uh, and to David. Thanks very much. Uh, it's been a great afternoon. Um, and yeah, that, that's lovely. Thanks very much. Pleasure. And I'll, I'll now uh, end the session. Thanks, thanks. Philip. Thank you for hosting as well. Thank, thank you very much, Philip. <laughs> OK, well. Thank you. I hope you've uh, enjoyed it. And thanks for uh, hanging on the end of a t telephone. Oh, for, definitely. For and I must and say, Philip, although I'm an Arsenal fan, I'm very keen on Liverpool as well. So I'm very <laughs> glad. <laughs> Good. That... All the best. Thank That's you. Okay. okay, bye. Cheers. Bye-bye.